once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of my sweet patootie Alice and my brother Mark, we want to welcome you, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of the Lord and Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. Yes. As we once again go into his word, his life-giving word, his precious word. The words of eternal life, yes. Uh, we're continuing our study on the whole armor of God. And a very, very important study it is, particularly at this time, because indeed we are in the perilous last days when the schemes of the devil, the attacks of the devil, the wiles of the devil, our adversary, seem to grow stronger day by day. So we need to be equipped to deal with that. And this is what this is about. This is what God has given us to equip us. So, so we're going to look at this, and we're going to start off in, in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 6. But be, just before we do that, I'm going to ask my brother Mark if you will ask God's blessing on our time together. Lord, we just thank you for your word to equip us the way we should be and to guide us in the way that we should go. Just fill our minds and our hearts with your word. Amen. And guard my mouth, Lord. Yes. In Jesus' name. Okay, Ephesians 6.16. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Before I start the comment, I want to, let, I want to share the accounts of some, of the, some others, the fathers of our faith. Abram, Abraham. It says in Genesis 15.1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And with Moses, it says, Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. Deuteronomy 33, 29. And David David in Psalm 3, verse 3, he said, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and a lifter of my head. And so many times did David talk about the Lord being his shield. Okay? Solomon, in Proverbs 30, verse 5, it says, Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Now, you have to take note of that qualifier there. Okay, in that particular verse I just read, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him, to those who are in Jesus and who put the Lord in front of themselves. We'll talk a little more about that later, okay? But then, in the next page here, all of those who I just mentioned, all right? Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon. They had seen warfare. Every one of them had seen warfare in the natural, all right? And yet they understood the spiritual truth. And now, from the Apostle Paul, who far more than most knew warfare in the spiritual realm and wrote the verse that we're studying, right? Yes. But he also said in Ephesians 6, so we're, well, what he said here is to take up the shield of faith, right? So let me just establish something. Right at the turn of the year, in the final Bible study that we did last year and the first this year, we talked about peace, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Peace in the midst of conflict, warfare, right? Yes. And I just want to read you a couple of verses that we, we looked at and studied back in that, which, by the way, is still up on the Bible Talk website and will remain so, okay? It, Peter wrote, 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. And then he goes on in the next chapter, five, verse, chapter 5, verse 8, and he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. And then, of course, Jesus said, famously, in, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. The enemy, the one who comes as a thief, is a con man. 
Right? He's been disarmed. When Christ was publicly displayed on the cross, Satan was publicly displayed as being disarmed. So he, when he comes to steal, he can't bonk you on the head and take what's rightfully yours. He has to, like a con man, talk you out of what is rightfully yours. He has to convince you to give him what is rightfully yours. All right? He's not going to bonk you on the head and take your spiritual gifts. You have to hand them over. There is only one that you have to surrender to. When you sing, I surrender all, I hope you're talking about Jesus. Okay? Now I want to read to you from Jeremiah. You might want to just uh, reference this for, for later, okay? Jeremiah chapter 9, I'm going to read the first eight verses. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfarer's lodging place, that I might lead, leave my people and go from them. For all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like the bow. Lies and not truth prevail on the land. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. He's talking about his own people, right? Yes. He says, let everyone be on guard against his neighbor, and do not trust any brother. Because every brother deals craftily, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. Your dwelling is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and assay them. For what else can I do because of the daughter of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceit. With his mouth, one speaks peace to his neighbor, but inwardly he sets an ambush for him. That's the arrow that flies by day that's spoken of in Psalm 91. Mm -hmm. the, the tongue. Yes. That deceitful thing, right? The shield is a shelter, right? That you have to hide behind. Right. Okay? A shield's not going to do you any good Actually. behind you. It's got to be in front of you, right? You've got to be behind it. So from Psalm 91, think about this. I'm going to read the first seven verses. He who dwells in the shelter, the King James says secret place, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrow that flies by day, or of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You have to be behind the shield where the enemy cannot even see you. Right. Now, pride, this is one of the great dangers of pride. Pride, you, you want to be seen by everybody. Mm. Well, I, know some, I don't want to be seen by any. I don't want to be seen by anybody. If nobody can see me, the devil's not going to see me. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, we have to learn to live the Word of God. When Paul wrote, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3. 3. If you're hidden, he's going to have a tough time, right? And there's no, you can't go to the store and buy camouflage. No. You can put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need the armor. That's and when you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, what are people going to, they're not, where, where, did, where did he go? Well, I see Jesus, but I don't see him. So this is very, very important. I mean, truly, truly. I mean, we really. Can I ask you, the, I was just thinking about the armor. The armor is Jesus, because all of the, the pieces of it are Jesus. Yeah, we're probably going to see that somewhere, yes. Because that is absolutely true, yes. Right. So it's so important to understand that you have to stay behind the shield, mm -hmm. inside the shelter. When the bombs are falling, you can't say, oh, there's a bomb shelter over there, and not go to it. Right. you got to get inside it, right? 
Jesus saw Peter and Andrew fishing. This is in the beginning of the Gospels, right? And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Matthew 4, 19 and 20. In Matthew 16, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Okay, the key there is, you can't follow from in front. I mean, it's such a simple statement, but it's so true. You follow from behind. And you have to keep your eyes on the one you're following, right? So the Lord, who made us, Fearfully and wonderfully, he did not give us eyes in the back of our head. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter, the finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, too. So you've got to be behind him, following him. It's interesting that the church is always trying to build up leaders. Yeah, managers, right? Uh, The Lord said that, you know, we're to pray because the harvest is white, the fields are white. We're to pray for workers to go in the field. He didn't say pray for managers. He's not looking for CEOs. He's got that covered. He's looking for laborers, okay? The ones who follow him. So we have to learn in our lives, if you want to be victorious and walk in the victory of Christ Jesus, to fix our eyes on Jesus, looking at the solution rather than looking at the problem. Okay? We, we had an incident here just last week where Al spent a little time in the hospital. And in that, when we were in the hospital, it was a Seventh-day Adventist hospital, and there was a lot of Christian material, inspirational material around, which was quite a blessing. But I was walking past the gift shop, and there was just a little card there, and it really, something on there struck me. It said, don't tell God what a big problem you have. Tell your problem what a big God you have. And boy, there is wisdom in that. It truly, truly is. When you look at, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, here is what you will see. You will see a life that was devoted to the scriptures. Right? When he was only 12 years old. It says in Luke 2, verses 46 and 7, Then after three days they found him, Jesus, in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Twelve years old. It's interesting, it doesn't say that he was teaching them. He was asking them to quit listening and asking them questions. You'd be surprised how important the questions that Jesus had. There's a Socratic teaching method where you answer and ask questions, both the teacher and the student. And not to get way off base, but I I am convinced Um, This is off base. I am convinced in my own life that the reason that that Socrates was forced to commit suicide in Greece, one of the most liberal areas, was because he had found Jesus Christ. That's another story. If you really want to know, write to me at office at BibleTalk.com and I'll send you a little thingy, all right? So immediately after Jesus was baptized, he went into the wilderness where the enemy attacked him, right? That that old that serpent struck over and over. You know, sometimes snakes they strike, they don't just strike one and one. Chick, 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 chick. So when when Satan attacked Jesus, he only had one answer. It is written. Why? Because he was devoted to the word, right? When you look at Jesus, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, you will see a life devoted to serving. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. That's what he said in Mark 10, 45, right? And then in John 13, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. And then it goes on and says, So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If, the, if I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also 
ought to wash one another's feet. You will see a life devoted to service. Okay? When you look at, when you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, you will see a life totally devoted to and lived directed by the Father. He said in John 12, 49, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. In John 5, 30, he said, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then in John 8, 28, Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative. But I speak these things as the Father taught me. When you look at, when you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, you will see a life totally surrendered. On that night of the Last Supper, it says in Luke 22, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he melt, knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. The lesson is simple. If your life, all of your life, is not directed and led by the Word, devoted to serving God and others, lived and directed by the will of the Father, and totally surrendered, then you're not behind the shield or inside the shelter. You're out in the open. And the devil is going to beat you up. Exposed. You're, the devil will beat you up. You know, it's great, the scriptures say, because Paul said it. He said, I walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. You start doing things on your own. You take your eyes off of Jesus, and you don't do this. You're not following what he did in your own life. You're going to get beat up by the devil. Now, that doesn't mean that the Lord will come along and rescue you at some point, but not before you have paid a price, Okay. It means that you're off the path of righteousness if you're not living like that, what I just said, right? If you've got to be there. You're vulnerable to the snares and traps of the, of the enemy. It means that as long as you stay off that path of life, Satan can defeat you. Now remember, like David said, right? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Psalm 34, 19. There's no doubt we're going to be attacked by the devil. But his attacks, it's a matter of whether you're having victory in the midst of that, right? Because as much as Paul was attacked by the devil, he was always living in victory in spite of that, right? Because on this narrow path that leads to life, you have to remember that Jesus said we are to take heed to what we listen to. Yes. Right? Mark 4, 24. That's very important. In our modern world, with TV, radio, movies, YouTube, Facebooks, on and on and on, and hundreds of channels and thousands of, of sites that are often no further away than the phone in your pocket, it's easy to forget that in the reality of life, it truly is digital. It's binary. There are actually only two channels. No matter what you're watching or what you're listening to, it is either the word or the world. Okay? It can come in different flavors, but that's all there is. It's either the world or the word. The word or the world. It's binary. Okay? And so, as you said, there's an L of a difference. Absolutely. That's very important. Yeah. <laughs> So, remember that the shield that we're talking about is a shield of faith. Now, that's why it's so important about what you listen to. Yes. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 4. But faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So, you need to be listening. You need to be tuned in and listening to the Lord. And by the way, you know, we're called to extract the precious from the worthless. Mm -hmm. So as you are in the world, but not of the world, you can see the things of the world, hear the things of the world, as long as you are spiritually appraising them so, and listening to what God is saying about those things, okay? He, 
listen, please, get this. It says in Ecclesiastes that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. Alice taught me a lesson about math. You might want to write this down. The answer is always three. That's true. <laughs> the answer is always three. Three strands, three strand cord. You have to hear the word, you have to speak the word, and you have to do the word. If you want triumph in your life, if you want to walk in the victory of Christ Jesus, you better get that in your head. You've got to hear it, you've got to confess it, and you've got to do it. When that, if one of those goes, it can be easily broken. That's true. Okay? And the reason that God has given us his faith is so we can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. That's what it says. That's what it says in our verse, right? Yes. So, put on the whole armor of God, we're going to be dealing with the, the devil. But then, but then, but wait, as they say on the infomercials. I'm sure that this must have happened in earlier history. But I am of, I, I was in the military, I flew in the Navy when Vietnam started through the beginning years of Viet, the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Not a conflict, not a police action, it was a war. Yes. And one of the things that showed up pretty much for the first time, now there's always been a thing called friendly fire, mm -hmm. where people have been killed by their own, by their, by, not by enemy forces, but wow. Typically by misplaced, you know, a, a bomber would fall on their own forces rather than, uh, that's friendly fire. But there was a thing they called fragging in Vietnam. And I think this was unique because it became all too commonplace where American soldiers would kill other American soldiers because they could get away with it in the heat of war. That's, that's friendly fire. It's very, very unfriendly, right? You know, uh, in 1971, there was a comic, I, I remember seeing this when it happened, called Pogo. Yes. It was a famous comic strip. And in 1971, I think it was Walt Kelly that did this comic strip. There was a famous one where these are animals, you know, cartoon animals, and they live in the swamp. Pogo was a, uh, I was not a raccoon, possum, that's what he was, a possum. And he had a friend who was called Alligator, who was an alligator in the swamp. And there's a, the cartoon shows them in this boat going through the swamp. And they're looking at, the, the swamp is filled with garbage, is what it is. And Pogo says, we have met the enemy, and he is us. All too often, one of the worst enemies that you're ever going to meet in your, in your life, spiritually, is the one you see in the mirror over there. Okay. Talk about fiery arrows. I, I said years ago, and this became kind of a common saying with me, the thing that can lead to death in the life of a Christian is a failure to repent. Thank God that we have, we have a God who is faithful to forgive. If we are faithful to confess our sins to him, Repent. Yes. And he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Because sin separates you from God. And separation from God is death. Right? Absolutely. But there is something. And here's what I've been saying. Excuses are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. If you've done something wrong, and you excuse it away, you make, make excuses, excuses for it, yeah. it will kill repentance in your life. You know, it says in James that we, we gotta be we have to be quick to listen, we gotta be quick to hear, right? And slow to speak. Slow to anger. Slow to anger. For the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. That's right. But the simple fact of the matter is we had better train ourselves to be quick to repent. When Adam was caught in his trespass, he didn't repent. Mm. You know, when he was caught in the garden, the first thing he did was ran and hid from God. He separated himself from God. 
That's what sin drives you to do. And when the Lord encountered him and said, "What's I'm, I'm trust me, I'm paraphrasing, unless it says it like this in the Message Bible, which is clear." Okay, okay. He said, "Adam, what's going on here?" And Adam said, "The woman that you made." He's immediately there's three of them there, and Adam places the blame on everybody but himself. Now it says it's sin that entered the world through Adam. He was the guy responsible, and yet. He's blaming God and he's blaming the woman. He's excusing it and failed to repent. I don't know what would have happened, and neither do you, if instead of running off and hiding, he would have ran and sought God, fell on his face, and repented. I don't know. I think we'd be in a different story. Yeah, I think maybe we'd be living a different story right now, okay? So train yourself. If you're going to be victorious in this battle, Train yourself. Know the word. Confess the word. Live the word. Follow Jesus Christ. Don't be eager to be seen. Be eager to be hidden in Christ Jesus. To go behind that shield. To go into that shelter. Where the arrows can't get you. Where the bombs can't harm you. Where God will have you in the palm of his hand. And no man can snatch you out. This is the word. And we have to train ourselves to live it. Okay? Amen. Amen. I, I don't want to start this right this minute because it's too, our time is too short. But we're going to go into the next verse in our next session, which is the 17th verse where it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Please be here for that. Okay? Encourage others. If you're being blessed by this, do me a favor and, and share with others. Tell others about it, right? I only do this because I want people to hear the word. And I'm not the only guy that has the word. But God's been using me for more than four decades to share share what he's told me. All right? And I thank you, Father, that you've done that. I thank you, Father, that you can use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. I thank you, Lord, that like back in the time of Balaam and Balak, you could even speak to a donkey, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, that you said that if people, if we won't do it, you know, we wouldn't praise you as they were doing in Jerusalem. The rocks would cry out. Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, that you can use us, that you would be glorified. So, Lord, we just praise you and thank you for this time we've had together in your word. Lord, help us to meditate on it as we go. Help us to think about it, to confess it, and to walk in it throughout this week. That we would be protected behind the shield and in the shelter, and that you, Father, would be glorified in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So, until then, be back. Okay, come back. Spend time in the Word. Share the Word with others. Just allow yourself to be used for the glory of His name. And until then, God bless you and goodbye. I will cling to that old rock Thank you.